All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed. Welcome to one more show. My assistant Tufi is outside. He might appear anytime in here. So today the discussion is about the anthrax. And we talked about anthrax pathophysiology yesterday. Today we are going to talk about the management of anthrax. Most of this is the recommendation by CDC. And this recommendation developed more as there were uh, bioterrorism attacks after 911 in the US. And after that, there has been a lot of progress on what should be the management. I think in that process, some people were given a lot of vaccine as well. There were some uh, folks who actually sued uh, Bay, uh, Bayer as well for ciprofloxacin and so on. And those, uh, uh, those uh, lawsuits did not go anywhere. They were defeated or withdrawn because of the uh, disclaimers attached to the drugs. But anyways, there is a lot of uh, progress in this. So let's start our discussion. The reference for primary reference for today's discussion is going to be it's going to be current book of medicine. So if you see here, this is the current medical diagnosis and treatment 2016 Lange current series. And this is where we have anthrax and then various things around anthrax. So that is the discussion we'll do very quickly. Let me just show you the disclaimer because we're talking about a medicine and this is not, so this is not a medical advice at all. This is mostly for educational purposes, for doctors, for clinicians, healthcare workers, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, and we would just discover what are the most interesting uh, parts of the management. So not a medical advice. Okay, so we, we're starting now. Hope everybody is doing good. Let's plow through this. There's a lot of uh, work to be done. So management approach to anthrax. I have no disclosures. Reference book is current medical diagnosis and treatment 2016. So clinical findings. So we're going to start with the clinical findings, signs and symptoms, then labs, then differential diagnosis, and then the management. And in the management, we'll talk about the prophylaxis, vaccination, management of cutaneous anthrax, management of GIT anthrax, management of inhalational anthrax, and to some extent, management of disseminated anthrax or the sepsis that may develop in meningitis. But usually what would happen is that when somebody is in ICU and they have sepsis going on or meningitis going on, then the ICU protocols would kick in and I would not be going through those protocols. So with this, let's start. So cutaneous anthrax occurs within two weeks after exposure to the spores. Latency to cutaneous is not present as with the inhalational. What that means is that with the inhalational anthrax, it is possible that there is some latent time before the infection starts uh, showing its signs and symptoms. Here, as soon as the uh, infection starts, the germination starts, the symptoms would start as well. Now, remember for the, the discussion we did yesterday as well, that the Usually, the tissue damage, local tissue damage, is preceded by the local lymph nodes. However, in the case of uh, cutaneous anthrax, there may be, in addition to the local lymph node uh, or lymphadenopathies or lymphadenitis, one would see the skin lesion as well. And there is a very telling skin lesion. Imagine what was happening. We talked about this yesterday. The lethal factor and the edema factor cause two main things and that is killing of the cell and secondly edema or the fluid accumulation in the area. So what do you expect would happen? There would have been some injury on a person's skin. There should be some abrasion, some cut, some open area of the skin. Then that person is near the spores or the anthrax. Maybe they're working with wool or they're, they're working in, um, in fields or they're working with livestock. Now anthrax spores or the anthrax bacteria started infect, infected that open wound and that is where the infection starts. So what would happen is there would be local tissue damage and necrosis that would eventually create a blackish area that is necrosed dead tissue. Plus there would be swelling as well. Most of the time what happens is that the secondary infection does not occur. So because of that, purulent discharge is not seen, which is normally seen with the skin infections. However, it cannot be ruled out. And in some cases, if the purulent discharge is present, then staphylococcal superinfection should be suspected as well. 
So if you see here, initial lesion is an erythematous papule, raised area with, with edema, red erythematous. It vesiculates and then ulcerates. So at first it becomes those tiny bubbles and then they break and the ulcers form or the break in the skin form. Necrosis happens next and then the red esker is formed. It's not red. A black esker is formed or tissue necrosis is formed. Now, interestingly, this esker, this little black area, is painless. Surrounding tissue is edematous and vesicular. Purulent discharge is not seen, as I said before. Adenopathy of the local lymph nodes is observed. And this is all logical because macrophages took the pathogen, bacillus anthracis, anthrax, to the lymph node. And by the time they reached there, the bacillus anthracis had come out of the vesicles within the macrophage and now is infecting the macrophage. Then that macrophage would break down and then the vesicle, the pathogen would come out and infect other cells and so on. So there would be local lymph involvement. Now, because this is an infection, of course, there would be infection related things. And what is that? Signs and symptoms. Fever would occur. Patient would become malaise. They may have headache, nausea, vomiting may occur as well. It's not necessary that these would happen in all cases. It depends upon the intensity. Usually, the cutaneous anthrax is self-limiting. It heals on its own or it limits and recovers. But if it starts becoming more spread, number one, number two starts going to the lymph nodes, number three starts spreading in the body. And what are the signs and symptoms of spread? If the systemic signs and symptoms, for example, fever and nausea and headaches are observed, that would start creating a problem for the patient. Now, inhalational anthrax. So the inhalational anthrax, we talked about that yesterday as well. The anthrax spores present in the air are breathed in or they go to the nasopharyngeal area and they stick there. So this could create anthrax of the and did I say anthrax spore? What I meant was bacillus anthracis spore. So whenever I say anthrax today for the discussion, if it is a pathogen, please assume bacillus anthracis. So it could cause nasopharyngeal area infections or the spores or the pathogen could go down to the deeper parts in the alveolar tree or the respiratory tree and cause infection there. And we did this discussion yesterday that it would usually not cause signs and symptoms of the tissue damage immediately. More common is going to be hyler, that is this area, hyler lymph node infection, which would then even cause this lymph node inside a chest to burst, which would cause hemorrhage or bleeding, which would cause our internal cavity of the chest to expand in the area of the bleeding. And what would shrink? I mean, chest is a closed structure. So if something inside expands, what is going to shrink? Lungs are going to shrink or heart would be under pressure. So when the bleeding would occur, that bleeding would push the lungs on the side and you would see mediastinum, anterior mediastinum, which is right behind this bone in the chest. There is anterior mediastinum. You would see in the imaging that that mediastinum has become expanded because there may be bleeding there. Now, the inhalational anthrax is actually seen in two stages. There is an initial stage, which is mostly nonspecific, and sometimes we miss it thinking this is viral anthrax. And by we, I have never seen an anthrax patient. And if we see an anthrax patient, we have a problem, and it needs to be reported to CDC right away. So when, when I say we, I mean healthcare workers, clinicians, professionals. So initial stage, fever, malaise, headache, dyspnea, cough, congestion of the nose, congestion of the throat, laryngeal uh, edema and laryngeal inflammation and so on. We can usually look at those symptoms and think this may be some upper respiratory tract infection. This could be coronavirus. This could be uh, you know, uh, other influenza viruses and so on. Anterior chest pain if present is indicative of the anterior mediastinitis, which I just spoke about before. Then, fulminate stage can occur. This was the initial stage. 
fulminate stage is a stage which just rapidly progresses and can kill the patient. So in the fulminant stage, more spread out stage, more deadly stage, signs and symptoms of overwhelming sepsis occur. Now the infection has go gone in the blood. Now it is traveling all over the body and we have disseminated anthrax. Now please remember, disseminated anthrax is actually, I'm so sorry, today it is very hot in this room, so I'm sweating. Disseminated anthrax by itself is not a disease. Meaning you don't get, let's say, just a cutaneous anthrax or inhalational anthrax or the GIT or the disseminated. Disseminated anthrax is a result of, let's say, pulmonary anthrax, which becomes spread in the body. So the fulminant stage has the sepsis and then sepsis related issues, deliriums and disorientation and the coma and death can occur. Of course, meningitis can occur in this process and in this specific case, if meningitis occurs, there is usually hemorrhagic meningitis. So irritation of the meninges signs will be on, for example, nuchal rigidity and so on. Plus, if the CSF is taken, there may be blood present in there. So anterior mediastinal bleeding, sepsis, and the bleeding in the CSF or the brain cavities as well is possible. Very dangerous. Now, GIT anthrax, once again, keep in your mind that usually the pathogen would attack some part of the tissue, let's say GIT, gastrointestinal tract. However, most of the time, the macrophages would take it to the local lymph nodes. So in case of GIT, though, those local lymph nodes are pious patches or pears patches. So these are really just patches of the lymphoid tissue present on the walls of the GIT and helping with the pathogens that are present in the GIT to keep them under control. So again, there could be non-specific symptoms and then there could be more specific issues. What are the non-specific symptoms? Most of the GIT issues cause what? They cause nausea, di diarrhea, uh, vomiting. In this case, because there is going to be bleeding as well, it is possible that there is emesis, there is vomiting with blood, or there is melina. Melina is stools that have blood in it. And of course, we all know, the physicians, the clinicians, that the blood in the stool should be looked at in multiple ways. For example, there is streaking of the blood on the stool. There is tinging of the blood with the stool. There is mixing of the blood with the stool. There is red blood versus black blood or blackened stools and so on. But generally over here, without talking about how to diagnose the blood's appearance on the stool and figure out where the bleeding may be, here just one thing, and that is usually when the upper GIT is bleeding, stomach and the upper intestine, small intestine, when that is bleeding, that blood itself gets digested as part of the digestive process of the, of the intestine. So when that blood reaches the stools or is it comes out with the stools, by that time, our own blood that was there has become digested and broken down. And those broken down pieces of the blood and various enzymes cause the stools to become black. But if the bleeding is occurring from the lower GIT, colon or uh, rectum or the anal canal, so then the blood will be mostly red. So red fresh blood tells lower GIT issues and blackened blood means upper GIT issues. So over here, melina may occur, blood tinged stools may be present, emesis may occur. Oropharyngeal form causes local lymphadenopathies as well. So we talked about that yesterday. Cervical edema can occur, dysphagia, upper respiratory tract obstructions as well. So this area can become all swollen too. Labs. So what do we want to see in the labs and what labs do we want to do? Of course, we'll do the complete blood counts and so on. So in the non-specific lab, just generally the patient is not well and there is an infection going on. So of course, we know that WBCs should start increasing in number, correct? So non-specific, WBC initially normal, and then they would start raising. 
But excuse me. But here's the important thing: just the increased number of WBC doesn't say this is anthrax. It could be any other reason, other infection, other reasons with the bone marrows. So it is a non-specific thing, but this would be found. The other important thing is polymorphonuclear cells will be seen. What does that mean? Poly means many, morpho means shape, nucleus is nucleus. So cells which have many shaped nuclei, these are actually baby cells. So what happens is when the anthrax attacks us or any infection attacks us, that is overwhelming us, our body attacks them back. And as part of the process of attacking back is to produce more WBCs or white blood cells. So when we produce more blood, white blood cells, they are not fully matured. We are just making babies and throwing them out in the blood to say, go fight. So those baby cells do not have the nuclei fully mature yet. Because of that, re really irregular multi-lobed nuclei are seen in the white blood cells, which is an indication that our bone marrow and our immune system is under stress and sending out troops fast. So polymorphonuclear cells will be seen. Pleural fluid, the fluid in the pleural cavities, the, the coverings of the lung. These can become, of course, infected and inflamed. And so pleural fluid may have hemorrhage in it. So one thing for the medicals here, everything hemorrhage, CSF, possible hemorrhage, GIT, possible hemorrhage, mediastinum, anterior mediastinum, possible hemorrhage, pleural cavity, possible hemorrhage. So hemorrhage is a common theme everywhere, blood spilling. CSF may be hemorrhagic. Gram stain, when you do the gram stain of the CSF, you would see the pathogen bacillus anthracis. And how do you see them? Number one, gram positive color. Number two, long chains of box car like structures. We talked about that yesterday. Rod shapes. Now, diagnostic lab. Of course, when you, <laughs> when you culture the pathogen itself, that would be diagnostic, correct? However, imagine that somebody was suspected to be, to have anthrax, or maybe even before that, patient came to the doctor. Doctor did not suspect this is anthrax. They thought this is some viral infection, as you saw that there are some non-specific, very viral infection-like symptoms. And doctor may have started them for viral infection. They might actually ask a patient to just go and take rest and, and you know, um, tell them if there is some issue. But sometimes if they feel that there is a, there is a supra infection, bacterial infection as well, because the temperature is swinging and all that, they might have given them antibiotics. So by the time this anthrax progresses further, patient may already be on the antibiotics. If that is the case, the culture is not going to show the anthrax pathogen. In that case, your diagnosis will become epidemiological and clinical. But if patient was not treated with the antibacterials before, then they would have culture as well. So now what are the possible things that we can do? We can also do the um, antibody test for the capsule of the pathogen. So we can see in the blood serum. We can also do PCR and then of course other serological tests as well. And CDC should be involved to start doing these tests because there is a very good chance that this may be bioterrorism or this may be just a normal natural infection because there is a chance of bioterrorism. And in the bioterrorism, there is an extra fear. And that fear is that it is possible that some bad actor can pick up bacillus anthracis, they can modify it, make it drug resistant, and then put it in a community. And all of a sudden, we will have a bacteria that cannot be controlled and it is deadly. Because of that, every case of anthrax, even if you suspect it is natural anthrax, the person works in a field or works with the livestock, or is a wool sorter and it makes sense that they had it because their environment was that way. Even then, CDC has to be involved. Imaging, chest x-ray, for example, 
in the last bioterrorism attack after 911 when the anthrax spores were sent out in the envelopes at that time when tests were done on people remember anthrax is not a very common disease that is just present every season the testing that was done in that testing 70% of the patients had mediastinal widening so be behind the chest here is mediastinum and mediastinum had expanded because of bleeding in there 70% of the patient 100% of them had pleural effusion what is that that is the blood uh, spilling in the pleura and you might be observing today that i look at my screen every so often i am not used to teaching with the um, slides i actually do not like slide teaching because i think that it is counterproductive to show slide for someone to read and then start speaking as well but anyways i want to make sure that i'm looking at it and i'm going point by point instead of just saying something else and on the slide there is something else clinical some of the clinical topics they need more writing so i thought today that i would go with the slides and save my arms so back here initially or or later pleural effusion so pleura are the coverings around the lungs and when they are inflamed there would be there would be fluid that is present in there and that would cause pleura to start becoming filled with the fluid when the pleura remember chest is a closed area in our body skull is a closed area inside the skull when there is tissue and that is expanding that tissue cannot go anywhere that is why sometimes brain inflammation is dangerous even to the point of killing a person because the tissue when it is swelling if it is not quickly helped that can kill because brain cannot go anywhere similarly inside the chest we have lungs we have heart we have esophagus we have other you know lymph nodes and stuff but it is a closed cage so when the lungs covering starts becoming filled with the fluid lungs would start collapsing because the fluid doesn't have any place to expand to outwards because outwards are ribs so it is going to press inwards and the lung collapse would start occurring so pleural effusion will be seen there may be hemorrhage in the pleural fluid as well and the third place is pelvis pelvis is also a bony structure which has a protection outside now 100% of the patients had pleural effusion some had it early some had it late but inhalational anthrax in 100% of the patients causes pleural effusion at least this is the result of the testing after the 911 Uh, anthrax attack 75% of the patients had pulmonary infiltrates what does that mean nowadays uh, covid is um, prevalent and we know infiltration means what it is the inflammation of the lung tissue which when seen on imaging would look like whitish spots which we say infiltrates why do we call them infiltrates that is where the immune system cells have infiltrated and a fight is going on and there is fluid accumulated and we are seeing that as white spots or white areas so we say here are infiltrates immune cells are here so one final thing about the inhalational anthrax this all could be subtle in the beginning imagine that the patient starts having anthrax and in the beginning the whole thing is just starting so it is not necessary that somebody has anthrax today and tomorrow they have all of these imaging changes it would change over time so in the beginning subtle and then slowly these would become more progressive and more severe now differential diagnosis what other things can cause this and we have been talking about some of the infections for now 20 months you know infections would cause immune system to become activated that would cause interleukins to be released that would cause cytokines to be released so as a result there are certain common inflammatory outcomes and signs and symptoms related to that so if you look here you would actually see and recognize a lot of signs and symptoms 
that can occur from other infections as well. So generally, when you're talking about an infection, you look at the local effect and you look at, look at the systemic effect. Systemic effects, for example, fever is a systemic effect or headaches are a systemic effect or diarrhea or nausea. On the other hand, local effect, if I have a cut here and that is infected and the local area is swollen and tender and all that, that is a local effect. So if you see here, cutaneous differential diagnosis is that what other diseases could cause similar pattern of signs and symptoms. And we should keep them in our mind when we are looking at these signs and symptoms so that we don't just start calling everything anthrax. So cutaneous anthrax, there could be ecthyma gangrenosum, rat bite fever, ulceroglandular tularemia, plaque, glanders, rickettsia, rickettsial pox actually, ORF or parapox virus or cutaneous mycobacterial infection, TB. These could create lesions that look like anthrax lesions. So when you, you have, you're looking at some erythematous specular lesions, you would have to, or even necrotic lesions, you'll have to kind of differentiate from these diseases as well. Inhalational. Now imagine respiratory tract infection. How many other things can cause respiratory tract issues and may produce similar side effects or signs and symptoms? Not side effects, signs and symptoms. Cough, irritation of the nose, irritation in the throat, and so on. So mediastinitis, bacterial mediastinitis, mediastinitis, infection of the mediastinum by other bacteria. Fibrous mediastinitis by histoplasmosis. Coxidodidomycosis, another um, fungus, viral pneumonia, silicosis, sarcoidosis, superior vena cova syndrome, aortic syndrome, and so on. Anything that can cause mediastinum to whiten could be thought of with anthrax. Or if, some, if you're thinking of anthrax, you may have to think about these things as well. GIT. Once again, somebody has nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you won't say this is anthrax. There are many, many diseases. Actually, most of the these GIT issues, they fall under two things. If GIT issues cause irritation of the GIT, the result of that is, this is a general statement, any disease, any substance that would cause irritation of the wall of the GIT. This is true even in some people who would eat spice and the walls are irritated. If the walls are irritated, our GIT's response is to secrete fluids to kind of dilute this irritant, dilute this poison. And the result of that is going to become diarrhea. Second thing is, because there is increased fluid, correct? The second thing is GIT would start moving fast. Why? It is going to try to get rid of this bad thing in us. So when it would move fast, we would get diarrhea. And similarly, if it starts moving in reverse, we'll get vomiting. If it stops, we get nausea. If GIT stops, for example, there is some disease that causes electrolyte imbalances. Calcium is less, potassium is less, magnesium is less, sodium is less. Electrolyte imbalances could result in GIT to reduce its function. That would cause constipation. So any reason that would reduce water would cause constipation because it would harden the stools. Any reason that would cause slowing of the GIT would cause constipation because GIT cannot push the stools out. It cannot process food and push the stools out. On the other hand, anything that would irritate the GIT and make it fast and fluid filled, GIT would fill it with the fluid to wash out the things that would cause na nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So here in anthrax, what are we seeing? We're seeing diarrhea. We're seeing nausea, we're seeing vomiting. That is a general thing. Of course, with that, there may be stomach pain and abdominal pain and discomfort as well. However, there is one more thing that is important for anthrax and that is bleeding. 
there may be emesis, there may be blood coming in the in the uh, vomit, or there may be melina, that is blood coming, clotted blood or coagulated or digested blood in the stools. But that also is not just for anthrax. There are many diseases that can cause that. Stomach ulcers. People with the liver failures may, may be bleeding near the stomach area and the lower esophagus, and they would have vomit with the blood, or they may have melina with the black stools. So again, differential diagnosis, you have to kind of think of all of those things when you are looking at a patient who may be anthrax. Now, if you suspect anthrax, you got to bring in CDC right away in this whole process. Now, treatment. Treatment of this one, when the anthrax attacks occurred, since then, there has been a lot of progress in trying to figure out what are the right things to treat, what is the right prophylaxis, what are the right uh, vaccinations, what are the right antibiotics for prophylaxis, and so on. In certain cases, I think vaccination was done just too vigorously and repeatedly, and that had its own outcomes. So here, most strains. So when you're thinking about management of anthrax, think about that in two ways. Bioterrorism, that would usually mean spores are involved instead of the actual natural pathogen. One. Second, bioterrorism might have a pathogen strain which may be different from the strain prevalent in that community or not prevalent, at least possibly present in that community or in the livestock. And the other, so if, it, if you suspect it is bioterrorism, management is still the same, but you have to keep in mind that this would be spores. On the other hand, if it is natural pathogen causing the infection, again, it is anthrax, but that is a different process. So most strains of bacillus anthracis, including the strains that are used in bioterrorism are susceptible to this whole list of antibiotics. But there is one important point. This, in today's discussion, as a physician, as a clinician, if you can just take away one thing, that will be that because of the possibility of bioterrorism, using anthrax spores or bacillus anthracis spores, the first-line drugs, penicillin and the amoxicillin, are not the drugs of choice, are not the drugs of choice. Why? Because we fear that the pathogen can be modified to add beta-lactamase enzyme to it. Beta-lactamase enzyme is used to throw out penicillin or amoxicillin from the pathogen. So this is, imagine that's a pump. And as the antibiotic comes in, the bacteria can neutralize it and throw it away. And that pump can be added to this pathogen in a, in a lab. And we would not know if the anthrax is terrorism or not. And if that pump was present in this pathogen or not, so we just do not give penicillin and amoxicillin. So these are not the first choice or drugs of choice. So what are the drugs? So look, penicillin, amoxicillin, chloramphenicol, clindamycin, imipenem, doxycycline, ciprofloxacin, other fluoroquinolones, macrolides, rifampicin, vancomycin. These can be given at least majority of the strains of bacillus anthracis in vitro or in cultures respond to these antibiotics. So this list should be with you. And a note should be there that the penicillin and amoxicillin are not the drugs of choice. So that's one. Then, also keep in mind, so we, we know that when managing this pathogen, we have to keep in mind spores versus the natural pathogen. We also have to keep in mind the the area or the type of infection, skin infection or cutaneous versus inhalational versus GIT, they all have different approaches. 
we also have to keep in mind those who are at the risk of catching bacillus anthracis. For example, with the bioterrorism attacks, they were uh, uh, postal workers. The, they were uh, envelopes sent to media, then military folks. So those who are at higher risk, they, for them, the management and the prophylaxis and vaccinations are present. So treatment based on animal studies and the concern with the lab modification that beta lactamases can be added. The first choice, as I said, penicillin and amoxicillin are not the first choice. Instead, ciprofloxacin. Cipro is the first drug of choice. And this is where some controversy comes in as well. What happened was when Cipro was given in large volumes, large volume doesn't mean too much, but to a lot of people after the bioterrorism attacks or the terrorism attacks, many people became sick with Cipro. And then they went to court and they said, we became sick with Cipro and they, they sued um, Bayer. However, the contracts for administering Cipro were written in a way to protect the company. So both, there were two times that they, they were sued, the company was sued, and both times the company, the case, one case was withdrawn, the other case was dismissed. But anyways, ciprofloxacin is the first choice of drug. Cipro is also the choice of drug for prophylaxis. In addition to Cipro or in replacement of Cipro, other fluoroquinolines could be used. For example, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin could be similarly active as with Cipro. And another first line alternative drug is doxycycline. So I hope this makes sense. And this also tells you as a physician, if you're going to give Cipro, and if you're going to give Cipro for anthrax, you have to make sure CDC is involved. You have to make sure patient is aware of the side effects of the Cipro. Both of those cases had this advantage that patient were made aware. And as unfortunate as it is for the people who are receiving these therapies, that they could not go and sue the company and get reparation, there, there is this protocol. Now, combination therapy, more than one agents. So combination therapy with an additional agent is given in following cases. Inhalational is dangerous. GRT is dangerous. Cutaneous usually is not that dangerous, but you shouldn't take any risk with the cutaneous as well. Important thing with cutaneous is something else. <laughs> and I find it difficult to keep an eye on the slides and then to talk as well. I think my own diagrams way is the best way for me. But think about it. Cutaneous management has an additional problem. And that is somebody has cutaneous anthrax. We are fixing that. But how did they get it? Were there spores? If there were spores, do they still have the spores in their environment? So normally after treating, you put them on a prophylaxis for 60 days or more days to make sure that if they still have spores in their environment, they do not become sick again. However, a more dangerous situation is with inhalational and GIT anthrax. So from a severity and the risk to the patient prognosis point of view, inhalational and GIT are more serious. From a spores point of view and exposure point of view, cutaneous is also severe. So that means you cannot take any of them lightly. Inhalational anthrax, disseminated disease. Disseminated means the disease from the lungs have now gone into the blood as well and the patient is developing sepsis. And normally once patient starts developing sepsis meningitis, it's very difficult to save them. Or cutaneous anthrax that is involving the face or head and neck area because that can then 
lead to uh, uh, meningitis and other such issues. So in such cases, you would not rely on just Cipro, not on one agent. You would add more antibiotics. So I hope that is clear. And this is also very important. If you feel that patient has systemic infection, what are the signs of that, signs and symptoms? Fever is a sign of systemic spread. If it is just one part of the skin, they may not have fever. They just may have a little escar on that skin and that's it. But if it is spreading in the body, then fever would develop. Malaise would occur. Tachycardia would occur because the blood pressure would start reducing and so on. So then you add antibiotics. Now prophylaxis from spores. First line ciprofloxacin, 500 milligram. You can look at this. You can probably take a screenshot as well. Ciprofloxacin, 500, or you can read it in the book too. These are standard structures. 500 milligram twice daily, orally, or 400 milligram every 12 hours intravenously. You can see a thing over here, and that is for how long is not written. Because the discussion of how long is a separate discussion. In some cases, one week may be okay. In some cases, 10 days may be okay. In some cases, after giving this uh, for the acute disease, then you have to start with prophylaxis. So we'll talk a little more on that too. It's a very complex and important disease and it is a very complex way to, uh, there are multiple steps to manage. Not complex, but multiple steps. So first line, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, 100 milligram every 12 hours, orally or intravenously. Second line, amoxicillin and penicillin, and we talked about it. If you suspect that the pathogen is res resistant to amoxicillin or penicillin, then the second line is of no use. Then go to another agent. Then alternative agents, what other agents? Rifampine, clindamycin, clarithromycin. So, so if you're just listening to this, let's say in a car or someplace, Rifampine, 10 milligram per kilogram per day, orally or intravenously. Clindamycin, 450 to 600 milligram every eight hours orally or intravenously. Clarithromycin, 500 milligram orally twice daily. Erythromycin, 500 milligram every six hours intravenously. Vancomycin, one gram every 12 hours intravenously. And imipenem, 500 milligram every six hours intravenously. Again, there is... How many days is not here? We will talk about that. So how long do we do this therapy? It is not well defined. We actually do not know five days or 10 days or 20 days or 40 days or 60 days. Natural disease. That means if you suspect that patient works in an environment from where anthrax may have been contracted or bacillus anthrax infected them then mostly the practice is seven to ten days for cutaneous two weeks following that so seven to ten days for cutaneous two weeks following clinical response for dissemination so once you give the medicine you see there is a clinical response you know that this medicine is now working then continue for two weeks so that dissemination not, does not occur this is especially with the inhalational and git Bioterrorism acquired disease has an additional concern and that is latent spore activation. So for example, somebody had received that envelope with the spores. In that case, giving them seven to 10 days for cutaneous or two weeks for GIT inhalational is not sufficient. You have to then put them on prophylaxis because their environment may still have spores. So 60 days continued therapy after the acute therapy so that the spores prophylaxis is done. Then, Raxiba Cumab, that is an antibody, human antibody, monoclonal antibody, that can be given as well. This is very interesting. We talked about three enzymes yesterday. Remember, we talked about protective agent, lethal factor, edema factor. For lethal factor and edema factor, which are the actual damaging enzymes, they still need to get into the cell to cause the damage. 
and the protective agent is the one that helps them get into the cell. So if we can block the protective agent, then we can block the other two things to go into the cell and cause the issue from doing that, correct? So there is antibodies against the protective agent, monoclonal antibodies. So these can be given as prophylaxis as well. And again, not by themselves, with the anti antibacterials too. Now prevention and prophylaxis. Antibiotics for 100 days instead of 60 days. One, vaccinations. Three doses over one month. Three times vaccination within one month. Plus 40 days of antibiotics. FDA has approved the vaccine for people at high risk of exposure, as I said before. People who may have received the letters, people uh, at that time, uh, postal workers, unfortunately, media workers, military. So what do they have? Cell-free antigen. What they did was they took the pathogen and they took the pathogen's antigen and that is what they make vaccine against. So it is a cell-free antigen, so not, not the whole bacteria. They break the bacteria and then they take parts of it. Now this vaccine is given over 18 months multiple times, multiple doses. Then yearly boosters are given. And mostly priority is for those who are at high risk. For example, folks who are involved in investigating the anthrax cases, those who are going to be working and they are going to be, they are targeted, for example, that happened with the postal workers and so on. So then they are given this vaccine and then repeated on a yearly basis. Raxibacumab is approved for prevention when other treatments are not available or are not appropriate for that person. Prognosis. What are the chances of the patient? So from a prognosis point of view, cutaneous anthrax has usually excellent prognosis. It is self-limiting. Patient recovers and they are okay. But in some cases, it can become systemic as well. And that can become dangerous. So see here, death is unlikely if the infection is localized. but if it starts spreading, then there is a problem. Most of the time, skin lesions would heal without any issues. GIT and, and inhalational type, they are more dangerous. And they have 85% mortality. 85%. Out of 100 people getting inhalational or GIT infection, 85% die out of 100. 85 die. Although this bioterrorism attack, in there, when they started giving the therapies, I think out of 11, there were five who died. So it was not 85%. These were all 11 inhalational. And they, uh, they were protected. And I think 11 were uh, GIT and they were protected. So that is credit to the latest therapies and supportive measures. Now, after this, after those attacks, Several thousand people who were exposed to spores were given prophylactic management that, that I just shared. And they were all okay. So prophylaxis has a strong um, contribution here. And I just want to make sure that we are at the right place. And then Thank you, and I'll stop here. So this is the discussion for today. Please do me a favor, um, like, subscribe, and share. If you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, or you can become a patron, or you can use PayPal. So thank you very much. And my one quick request, uh, I have to take my wife out for a little shopping she wanted to do. And so if you can uh, allow me for today to not have a chit chat, 
we can meet each other on Monday. So I'm just going to quickly see here if that is okay. Luis Grande says, good stuff. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yes, yeah, so Lily feels you are correct. This was Dr. Irvin, and he had sent the uh, supposedly, allegedly, but before he was arrested, he committed suicide. Okay, excellent. So everyone have a great weekend. I'm gonna go out for a quick shopping and then I'm gonna go and enjoy my long, my weekend as well. So see you on Monday. Bye-bye.